Welcome. Uh, so hello, I'm Dale Jarvis, and today is the 11th of May 2020, and I'm having a chat with Donna D. Payne. Uh, thank you for joining us, and we're having a chat in the midst of all this uh, COVID-19 uh, situation. How, how are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Learning lots of new stuff. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, yeah, learning lots of new stuff. I decided to take things back to grassroots during the uh, the lock, isolation lockdown and learn some new old things, um, some very old traditions. Um, sourdough baking goes <laughs> back thousands of years. It's the first form of leavened bread. So let's uh, let's have a little just to put this uh, in a little bit of context. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, wh where are you? Where are you located? Where are you? Where are you calling in from? I'm calling from home in Newfoundland. Yeah, and you're in St. John's? Mount Pearl. Yeah, okay. Mount Pearl. Mount Pearl. Yeah. And when did you start to realize that this was a little bit uh, out of the ordinary, that the situation that was unfolding is a little bit uh, more, than, uh, more than we were used to? Probably um, late February, early March, when everybody was talking about how it was spreading, so how COVID-19 was spreading so quickly, and then cities were shutting down, Europe was shutting down. We had, uh, myself and my husband had trip, had uh, booked a trip to Spain for April and we were watching everything intently to see what was going to be closing down. And as the world started shutting down, everybody was saying, okay, well, things are starting to go crazy. Toilet paper is running out, yeast is running out, bread is running out. And I had started, um, I'm a, I call it my sourdough journey. I had started my sourdough journey actually before the shutdown. I had been watching John Favreau on the chef show back in late January, early February. And he had on his show one day, he had about how to make sourdough. And he said, it's very easy. Just add flour and water, feed it a couple of times and you have your own sourdough mix. I had eaten sourdough before but had ne I love sourdough bread, uh, but had never really researched and I said, no, can't be that easy. So I did some online research and there's lots of, lots and lots and lots of resource material online about sourdough. And sure enough, it is that easy. You add a cup of water, a cup of flour, feed it, discard half of it every day so it doesn't grow into this big monster that takes over your house. And sure enough, in about a week to 10 days, you have enough to uh, make your own bread. So that's what I did and uh, started off very, very poorly because I was never any good at making bread. All of my family is, but I could never make bread myself. And uh, my first couple of loaves were atrocious. One was like a Frisbee. Um, and then just started practicing. The yeast Connolly grew bigger. I call it my wee yeasty beastie. And uh, it's gotten healthy. And a lot of people have actually taken some of my mother's starter now and started their own Connolly. But um, yep, and actually I have, that's today's loaf. <laughs> oh, it's lovely loaf. Delicious, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it is, it is, I'm, I'm addicted to it and I'm obsessed with it. I make everything with it. I've made croissant, I've made pan au chocolat, I've made these things called croffins, which is like a mix between a croissant and a muffin with chocolate swirled and then we can do various things. I've made cinnamon rolls, um i made brownies this weekend out of it and it's just yeah it's you don't need yeast <laughs> you don't need to buy commercial yeast and it's healthier for you so i want to i want to go back to this uh, idea because you you say you said oh it's it's so easy and and as someone who has never done it you know i've looked at videos and there's so much information online and it mm -hmm. looks it looks complicated like it looks like there's so many variables and different ways of doing it um so can you walk me through the, the, the process and, and how do you know if it's working? Like you said, you had a few failures at the beginning. Yep. Can you just walk me through it? How, do you, how, you, got, how you start off and, and how to avoid the failures maybe? Yep, absolutely. Well, like I said before, I mean, this, this has been going on eons before the advent of technology and before the advent of kitchen scales and computers and all this stuff. And basically, it's just mixed in water and flour and feeding it every day. It's like a new pet, basically. You have to feed it, it's a living organism. So 
you start off with a cup of water and a cup of flour and you leave it for a couple of days and you'll, you'll cover it and just put it on your countertop and you leave it for a couple of days and you'll start to see some bubble action happening and you it'll start to show some life then you discard half of it and whatever weight it is you feed the same weight in wa water and same weight in flour so the ratio is one to one to one one sourdough starter one water one flour no matter how much you're putting in there it's always one to one to one so after after about two to three days, maybe four, when you're starting seeing a lot of bubbling action there, then you uh, you start to feed it two days a week, or or sorry, two day, two times a day. So in the morning, in the night, it takes five minutes mixing your flour, mixing your water, and then probably in about um, ten days, you'll start to see doubling in the jar, so it'll expand. So what I do is I put a piece of masking tape on my jar. And when I feed it, I'll put the masking tape at the level where it is, and it will literally rise up the jar because it's it's the gases and the yeasts expanding. And what it's doing is pulling all the yeast, natural yeasts in from the air, because there's fruit gives off yeast, there's yeast on your hands, there's yeast in the air everywhere. And it's just collecting all of the yeast from the air, and that's what it feeds off of. So commercial yeast is just someone figured out a way to commercialize it and sell it, but it's basically the same thing. But, excuse me, but the nat natural yeast is more healthy for you and it's easier to digest. And, and the sourdough bread making process is a longer process. Commercialized yeast, you probably have to rate, let your bread proof and rise for maybe two to three hours. This is a longer process, but a shorter time because yes, you have to put it in uh, what I do is I make my my leaven and my bread one day and then I put it in my fridge to let it proof overnight and then bake it the next morning. With a net, with a commercial yeast, if you put it in your fridge, it'll just explode and puff up all over the place and make a mess. Because natural yeast is slow acting, if you put it in your fridge, it'll just ferment perfectly overnight and that's what gives you your nice sourdough flavor. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is easier. And then with natural bread making as well, uh, or sorry, with commercial bread making as well, you, there's a lot of hand kneading. With the natural yeast, it's a more gentle uh, type of thing where you just do what we call stretch and fold. So you literally lift up your dough, fold it over, lift up your dough, fold it over. You do that four or five times and that's all the kneading that you need to do. So it's it's good for so, it's especially good for someone who has problems with their hands. So an arth, or, or someone who has arthritis or someone who can't really get into the dough and knead it, because it uh, it's a more gentler action, and you just leave it and it just does its own magic. It's but like I say, you do have to you. There's something called a window pane effect, where you do your you. You mix in your flour and your water, leave it for a half an hour. That's what they call an auto lease. Then you mix in your salt because your salt tends to slow down your yeast. So if you mix it in when you mix your flour and your water and your lemon and your uh, sourdough starter, it won't work as well. So you mix your sourdough starter, your water and your yeast first, let it sit in the auto lease for at least a half an hour, mix in your salt and then you do your stretches and your folds. And depending on how many stretches and folds you do every hour, you start to see the dough get silkier and you can actually pick it up and when you let it hang like this and it droops down, it's almost like, it's like a membrane, like it gets thinner and thinner. You can see like a window pane effect and that's when you know that your bread is good, that you're gonna have a good rise. And then you let it proof and let it rise. So my first, when I started, I wasn't really following that technique. I was just sort of kneading it the, the normal way that you make the homemade Newfoundland bread and that's why it was coming out like like a, a frisbee because I wasn't actually getting the nice window pane effect and building up the gluten because you have to build up the natural gluten that's in the flour. Right. So I started watching some videos online and learning more and it's a very wet dough as well and that's something that probably a lot of Newfoundlanders are not used to because you're used to mom's big puffy you know bread dough that rises in the pan where, where this is a very wet dough and you have to you have to treat it very gently 
and you can't add a lot of flour to it because it will get tough. And that was one of my big mistakes too, because I was working it and I was saying, oh my gosh, this is so wet. I need to add flour. And it just eats up the flour. It's, a, it, it's meant to do that. It just eats up the flour and then you get end up with a very, very tough loaf. Whereas if you leave it with the amount of flour that's in the recipe and you have your wet loaf, your wet dough, it creates all of the, uh, all the lovely little holes. The, the wetter the dough, the more holes you get. Hmm. So that's basically, and that's, then, that's, and then explain to me the, uh, the baking process. Um, it's done in a very hot oven. And some people prefer to use a Dutch oven, a cast iron oven, but you don't have to if you don't have. I bought a Dutch oven. I also bought um, a French bread making uh, clay pot called a cloche, a bread cloche. And it looks, it looks like a big roaster, but it's made out of clay. Um, what some people do is they have a pizza stone. You heat up your pizza stone in the oven, put your bread in, and then cover it with some ice cubes next to it. Um, because it's the steam that actually makes the bread rise. Mm. So when you take your loaf out of the fridge after it's proofed overnight, it's cold, so it goes into the oven, the heat hits it, and the steam causes it to rise up, and that's what we call an oven spring. So then, um, like I said, you don't have to use a, a bread cloche or a Dutch oven if you don't have one. Uh, some people use the pizza stone. Some people just use a, um, a a cookie sheet upside down, and they put the bread on top of it, and then they put um, another sheet, a pan, and underneath it with ice cubes or hot water in it, and close the oven door, and the steam releases that way. So, in order to get a good rise on your loaf, you do need to have the steam effect. And some people spritz their their dough with water before they put it into the oven because that will give it um, a nice blistery crust and cause some steam as well. And then there's a technique called scoring where you, have, where you see a lot of people use different patterns on their bread. Years ago, when everybody went to the communal bakery, when nobody had stoves in their houses, um, that's how they would identify their own bread was the way the pattern that they had scored on it. You need to score your bread because if not, it'll just burst everywhere with the heat. So scoring it, gives the expansion different specific places to expand. So bread doesn't just blow out on one side and look like a big weird inflated tire. So a lot of, a lot of families got their own pattern and uh, used their own design to identify their own bread loaf when they were going to the communal bakeries years ago. And now people just use it as an art form. I mean, some people have really intricate patterns when they score their bread. And what are you doing with the scoring? Have you come up with your own kind of preferred method? I just, I just do freehand. I've done um, hearts on them. I've done leaves. I've done some wheat grains. And other people do stencils as well. And uh, that's just, you just wet the, the loaf before you put it in. And you literally use a stencil. So you can use a plastic stencil or paper, paper stencil, whatever you want. And you sprinkle flour on it. And then you lift off the stencil and there it is. And if it's a if it's a really dark loaf, then you can use cocoa. So you have, or sorry, if it's a really light loaf, you can use cocoa. But if it's a really white loaf, then you can use white bread, uh, white flour. So it shows up. And people really, it it's really is an art form. It's just amazing how some people do it. So it sounds like you've gone all in on the sourdough. I am. <laughs> Total bread. <laughs> I'm a breadhead. <laughs> so, you know, before this, uh, before the lockdown started, would you, would you have thought that you would be sitting here now having this conversation at this, at this level of detail? No, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. Like I said, I had, I had gotten interested in it back in January and February when I was watching John Favreau do it. Yeah. But, and then when, when I started creating the yeast and then everybody was saying, oh, we can't find flour, we can't find yeast. And I was saying, well, I've got natural yeast. Come get some of my starter. So I've, got, I've probably got about 30 grandchildren starter out around town now <laughs> because people have started on, the, on their sourdough journey. And it's uh, you totally geek out on it because you, you keep journals about how much water you're putting in this time and how this loaf turns out and what temperature you cook this at and how long that you left it in there with the cover on and taking the cover off. And yeah, it's it's 
it's definitely a pastime for sure. So are you keeping a, are you keeping a bread journal then? Do you, do you keep a notebook of, of what works and what doesn't? Somewhat. Yeah. Yeah, somewhat. I, I have a, a, a technique of, okay, well, I've tried this recipe. I don't like it. And then I'll say, okay, but this is my go-to favorite recipe that I use all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them is just, it's just really easy. And it's just an everyday, I call it an everyday everyday loaf because you can bake it in the same day. Most most sourdough journey, uh, bread baking takes two to three days because you have to let it prove for so long. Some people mix their leaven the night before, then mix their dough in the morning, then let it proof the whole day and then bake the next day. The one that I use is just really easy. It's just mix it in, let it sit for a half an hour, mix your salt in, let it sit for four hours and each hour do your rotation around the bowl of your folds and, and tucks and then let it proof for and then when you're uh, when it's on your counter you have you have to shape it as well to get it into either a banneton which is a, a bread making basket my husband says it reminds him of uh, Moses in the rushes <laughs> because <laughs> it's these beautiful rattan baskets and it creates the nice pattern that you see on sourdough like the lines I got some of those online. You don't have to use those. I was using a butter container beforehand and it worked yeah. out fine. You just need to make sure that you flour it and put a lot of, uh, you use a tea towel and you flour the tea towel so that it doesn't stick to it. Um, but you have to really shape your dough so that you get a lot of tension in it. And that's, that took me a lot of time to practice with because the dough was so wet. But once you get the hang of it, it just comes second nature and you develop a muscle memory. And it's just the way that you fold the dough to create and drag it along your counter that creates the surface tension and that's what gives you your nice crust so yeah it's it takes practice but once you get into it you really get into it and you say okay what how, how can I up my my challenge now how can <laughs> I use more hydration in the dough yeah so you're at the point now where you can experiment and try some different things and yeah see what works yeah yeah yep, exactly do you have a favorite um, you were saying at the beginning that you, there are these other things that you have made with it other than just your standard loaf. Do you have a, a yep. favorite? Definitely the pan au chocolat. <laughs> they're, they're like a chocolate croissant and they are, they're sinful. I usually, <laughs> I usually make those every Saturday morning. Yeah. yeah, but it's a process. I have to start it on Friday to make them on Saturday morning. Yeah. bake them on Saturday morning. Now there's been a, there is a kind of a growing community of people, it seems on, on, on through Facebook, for example, like this is where I learned that you were doing this. Um, yep. And are, are, is that something that has, um, was it created during the, the pandemic or did it already exist before, before all this? No, uh, myself and a friend of mine, um, we had got the, I had given him some of my mother starter and he's just taken off with it as well. And uh, when everything started with everybody saying that there was no yeast and stuff, well, we said, well, why don't we just start this Facebook group and get it started on that? So it's the uh, Newfoundland Labrador um, Facebook uh, sourdough, sorry, Newfoundland Labrador sourdough revolution is what it's called. <laughs> and we've got 97 members so far. And it was just a way of us basically getting it out there that look, you know, if you need some sourdough starter, we have starter because most sourdough bakers hate to throw away their starter because and, or, you have to discard some of it. If not, it'll take, it'll take over your house. So, and people hate to throw away their discard because it's such a lovely little viable thing. So if you can find someone that will take some of it, then that's great. So we decided to start this Facebook group for anybody who was looking for starter to be able to get starter here so that you don't have to go on your journey to create it your own from scratch. Now, that being said, when you do get a discard, you still have to feed it for a couple of days before it actually wakes up and starts behaving like you want it to, to, right. to bake. So I generally say feed it for three to four days with the instructions that I give when I send it out, when I give it to somebody and then it becomes viable enough to make bake. So, and then how, that way. how much of it do you then retain? Like, so you want to make, you want to make a product out of the, yep. your starter. How much of the starter do you keep? 
Um, if I'm just feeding my starter and not planning a bake, I usually bake um, Wednesdays and Saturdays. Um, so if I'm not doing a bake, I'll usually keep back probably, I've heard of people keeping back as low as 10 grams of starter, feeding at 10 grams of flour, 10 grams of water. I'm not that, I'm not quite comfortable with that yet because I, I'm afraid that something will happen with my starter. So I generally keep back about 50 grams to 100 grams and feed 100 grams of water, 100 grams of flour. The um, sourdough uh, recipe that I have, my go-to everyday recipe calls for 150 grams of starter. So if I'm feeding, if I, if I have 100 and I feed it 100 grams of flour and 100 grams of water, I take 150 of it out, then I have 150 left. Right. So. I generally give people, if someone wants some of my starter, I'll give them 50 grams. So then I'm back to my 100 grams. But again, I mean, everybody has made it so complicated nowadays when our forefathers would just mix it together and just let it rise and it would do its own thing. Yeah. And, I, and I've heard stories about people or, or businesses who have sour, sourdough starter that is like 100 years old, that it, 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 it will kind of... Uh, keep forever because you're constantly yep. adding and subtracting yeah yeah yep. but it's it's true and it's not your actual starter itself will take um, so a lot of people say oh well san francisco sourdough is the best what will happen what will happen is yes that's fine in san francisco but if you get some starter from san francisco and take it to newfoundland it's going to start developing the yeasts and, and feeding off the yeasts in Newfoundland. So it's not going to be a sour, uh, sour, a San Francisco sourdough anymore. So when someone says, oh, I've got a starter that was in the 1800s, it probably began back then, mm -hmm. but your, your, your actual product is probably only about a month old. The, the yeast colony that's living in it is probably only about a yeast old, uh, about a month old, sorry, because it wouldn't be it wouldn't be able to live that long. Right. It's, it's right? the but same, the, it's the same family, but it's not, sorry, yeah, it's like, it's like a family tree. It's not, it's not the same individual. It's like, yeah, it's grown exactly. over time. Yeah, over time. Yeah. Exactly. So the, yeah. the Facebook group, um, the Sourdough Revolution group, uh, who's in it? Like who, who makes up the, who's part of this revolution? Um, there's myself and uh, a local um, coffee aficionado that uh, pre that sells his own roasted coffee. He gets he actually gets the beans in. Um, Steve Bannister he gets the beans in from um, somewhere over in Kenya. Well, he has different flavored beans, different types of beans, and he roasts them himself. And he has a small cottage industry industry that sells roasted coffee. Um, there's Barry Porter, who is the Rock Recipes author, and he does some gorgeous, gorgeous sourdoughs. Um, there's another guy in there that actually works for a local bakery. Um, he hasn't told us which bakery he works at yet, but he does some beautiful loaves as well. And just generally everyday people. So it's just, you know, some novices, some intermediate, intermediate bakers, like myself, some professional bakers, some people who have heard about sourdough and don't know what it is and want to learn. And just basically every, every type of person out there, I guess. So if, if someone like myself, a total newbie, uh, wants to get started, what's your, what's your advice? What, what, where do I start? Fine, you can either start your, sour, your sourdough starter yourself and patiently wait the two or three weeks for it to get alive, or you can find someone who's generously willing to give you some of their starter, and then you just nurse it for a couple of days if, you, if you've gotten a mother starter from someone else. Um, in Italy, the tradition is if someone gives you some of their mother, mother starter, it's considered a great honor. So um, yeah, if someone, if someone is offering you some of their starter, that's cool. <laughs> okay. So. You know, you just take, it, it's easier to have it already established and you just feed it a couple of days and then you can start baking with it. So that's, that's my big suggestion. Find someone that uh, has some starter that's already established. As a matter of fact, I'm in several sourdough starter groups. 
um, one is an international group, one is a Canadian group, and our, our own local one here. The international group, um, there was someone in there that literally was giving away little baggies of sourdough in his neighborhood, and he had it tacked up to a telephone pole. You know, this, this is a starter, his name is Garth, he's an all white starter, please take care of him, this is what you do. Because I guess he was overrun with starter, and like I said, I mean, people hate to throw away their discard. So people find creative ways of making things with your discard because you can make crackers, you can make pancakes, um, some people make crepes. So, and, but there's only so many things that you can make with your discard and then you get kind of tired of it. So if you can find someone that can take some of it and continue on the generation, then that's perfect instead of just throwing it out. Well, this has been fascinating. Thank you for uh, <laughs> thank you for this. Um, well, do you want some starter? <laughs> well, yeah, I think well, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to work out some uh, some starter because yeah, I am very very curious uh, yep. about the whole process. So, uh, well, maybe this is a good place to end. And if people have um, if people are in kind of the the Avalon area, they can join the the group. Well, I guess they can be anywhere and and join the Facebook yep. the Facebook group. But is it mostly kind of Avalon Peninsula people? Uh, I don't know. Really, I haven't really taken a, a, a roll call of the ge geography of where everybody is. But you can dry out starter and mail it too. Now I don't know how Canada Post would feel about you mailing <laughs> dried flour to somebody. But people on the other Facebook group that I've uh, that I'm on actually dry out their starter and mail it to other people. There's one girl on there. She got some starter from Australia Interesting. from another friend of hers. And she's oh, okay. In the so yeah, there's we'll very have to have, We're gonna have to have a chat. <laughs> Yep, All right. Definitely. Thank you for this, Dee. You're welcome. Take care. Take care.